everyone, and welcome to CTL's Professional Education, Professional Development Series. My name is Stephanie Shea. I'm the Marketing Manager here at CTL. I'm going to get this slideshow looking better for you. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I'm joined by Walter Germer. He's our Technical Specialist. For those of you who are not familiar with CTL, we're headquartered in Portland, Oregon, and have been providing innovative IT solutions to education and government customers for over 26 years. We're also a Google for Education partner. And our most popular products include ruggedized CTO laptops, convertibles, two-in-ones, and tablets designed specifically for K-12 education. Over the last three years, we've been working with Google to introduce a line of Chromebooks, and they've been recommended by PC Magazine as the best choice for Chromebooks in education. As part of our commitment to education, CTL is offering monthly professional development webinars for our education customers, and they include a variety of topics relevant to K-12 ed tech. Uh, they do have a big focus on Google Apps for Education and Chromebooks in the classroom. But today is a topic, YouTube authoring tips and tricks. I'm really excited about this one, having peek, taken a peek behind the scenes of what Catherine has in store for us. And um, there's a lot of things I did not know you could do in YouTube. Um, so our presenter is Catherine Leivik, and she's our professional development partner, Education Service District 112 of Vancouver, Washington. And before we get started, I'm going to go over a few items. Oh, it sounds like maybe somebody can't see the slideshow. Hold on. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. I didn't realize someone is letting me know that they can only see my desktop. OK, can you now see the slideshow? Thank you for letting me know that. <laughs> um, OK, hopefully, OK, now the slides. And this is really essential to see because I'm going to describe your desktop. What I was showing earlier, they're saying it's not full screen. OK, now it is. I'm glad I have some help behind the scenes this morning. So I was just running through some slides that showed pictures of our Chromebooks and our presenter's name. And now <laughs> I'll continue with um, just going over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation and we'll just collect them and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So before we get going, we have a couple polls to find out a little bit more um, about our attendees today. The first question is, do you use YouTube in your classroom? So we're going to find that out, and then we'll have a follow-up question for those of you who are using it. I'll give everybody a few moments to answer this poll. Okay, I think a majority of people have voted. Oh, there's still some votes coming in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and we'll check out our results. Um, it looks like 60-40 split, 60% 60 are using YouTube and 40% haven't. So now I would, of those people using YouTube, um, are you using it to produce videos or show videos? 
I suppose we could have had an option <laughs> that said both, um, but maybe just what you're using in general, um, you know, is it more for production or to show video? So this is great. We're getting lots of votes coming in. Just a few more minutes, or probably not even minutes, but <laughs> seconds. Okay, I think the voting has stopped. So for this one, we've got 75% are showing and 25% are producing. So maybe those numbers will move, maybe people will start doing more production after this webinar because that was something I thought was very interesting. Okay, so let me get back to this screen. Thanks for your patience. I'm on a smaller screen this morning. Um, okay, so now I'd like to introduce Catherine Livick. She's our presenter today from Professional Development Partner Education Service District 112 of Vancouver, Washington. Catherine is a Google Certified Trainer and Google Certified Administrator, and she has some really great tips and tricks in YouTube. So welcome, Catherine. I'm going to pass the screen off to you. Hello. All right, let me get uh, <clears throat> my presentation up here. Go to meeting is always fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, it's just like I'm speaking into the abyss. But I hope you all can see the the slides there. <laughs> I'm seeing it great. Yes, okay, I have good. some um, helpers this morning messaging me if things right. aren't showing, which is okay. wonderful. <laughs> trouble. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Catherine. And uh, like Stephanie said, I work for uh, ESD 112, so we work with a number of districts in our region and we go do coaching and technology integration. So we get to see a lot of different ways that uh, Google tools and technology tools in general are used. And um, one of the things that I've been uh, using more lately with teachers uh, is YouTube. And until a few months ago, even I didn't really know that some of these options and tools were here. So um, I think there's some kind of cool things to discover about YouTube, and there's also some you know issues that people run into. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about all of that today. Um, so what your poll that you all answered kind of came out the way I was expecting. Most people do know what YouTube is, and most people um, use it some in their classroom if it is allowed in their district and there are still some districts that have it completely shut down because they are concerned um, about student access to videos and and rightly so there's a lot of stuff on YouTube that's not appropriate for school or life indeed and um, <laughs> some of it is you know stuff you don't want kids getting into during school hours um, there are ways to control um, certain parts of students access to YouTube from the administrator side of things so if your uh, district is having issues with that then um, hopefully you have administrators uh, people who would run your Google tools at the district level who can kind of figure that out and uh, find some ways to like force the uh, restricted mode onto YouTube and stuff just to know that there are options there so if you are in a district where they're telling you, oh, we can't use this at all, there are um, probably more options than they might think. So it's just good for you to know that so you can kind of advocate for this tool because it's a great tool. Um, but most people who are using it in their classrooms are just using it to find videos and show them to their class. Um, some have moved on to asking students to find videos uh, as part of a response or as evidence or you know, a resource for something they're doing in class. Um, but a lot of people don't know that you can not only upload your own videos uh, as a teacher, have your own teacher channel that is just for your uh, school videos, but you can also do some video editing in YouTube. And that's the part that I really didn't know much about until a few months ago. Um, you can uh, 
definitely supplement your classroom instruction with videos. Uh, if you're into flipping your classroom or semi-flipping your classroom, you can do that using YouTube. Um, when I was in the classroom a few years back, I most recently taught sixth grade, and I didn't flip my classroom because I was in a, a place where students did not have access to the internet or to devices at home with the consistency that I would have liked. Um, but and, and so that for me was a reason not to totally flip the classroom, but I, I think um, even if you're in that kind of a situation where a lot of your kids don't have access at home, you can still use video to, you know, give a def an extra resource to your students, um, something for them to come to after class if they are doing homework and they're able to access um, your YouTube channel from the library or their friend's house or wherever they're at or on their phone. Um, so they can kind of see uh, an explanation for something. If you explained a concept and you know some kids are going to need to go back and refer to that explanation again, you can record yourself doing that and uh, put that up on your channel. Um, so there's some pretty good reasons for you as a teacher to use it. Um, with permission, you can share your students' work on YouTube, and that can be a really, really cool way to give them an authentic audience and make their tasks kind of more authentic and real world and engaging. Um, and you can not only share what they've done by recording it yourself, but you can teach them how to use video as another response mode using the tools in YouTube. And um, I think student-centered instruction right now is moving towards a place where we really need to give kids choice in how they respond, um, how they show us what they know, and if the more we can open that up, depending on our population of students, the, the better off we generally are. So letting them make videos as a response mode is kind of a cool thing to do. Um, so there's a lot more stuff that you can do with YouTube other than just watch a video. So if you're going to use YouTube as a teacher, you're going to want to set up your channel first. And the the YouTube settings are a little bit forbidding, I think. Um, there's just a lot there, so I would encourage you to go kind of poke around quite a bit <laughs> and <clears throat> excuse me, just see what is there and what you can do. You do have some options. Um, they will put ads beside your videos unless you tell them not to, as you can see from this little screenshot. Um, you can kind of decide whether or not you want that to happen. Um, you can uh, upload a profile picture and some channel art, which is the banner that goes across the top of your channel when someone is viewing just all of your stuff on YouTube, which is what your channel is. You can put a description or some keywords on your uh, channel so that if you want to make things public, um, for instance, if I'm as a, as a teacher searching for something about, I don't know, engineering, uh, maybe I would put in the keywords engineering, teacher, seventh grade, or STEM, or something to, to show that I'm looking for an education-related engineering video. And um, that's the kind of thing that can help people find your channel if you want to share those resources publicly. Um, and you do have those advanced settings that also can say where you're at, and just you can kind of control the amount of information that people see about your channel on that page. And we'll pop out into YouTube a couple of times during this presentation so you can see a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, you'll have access to this presentation after the webinar, and there are some links in here and some little videos that might help you uh, have an idea of how this stuff works if you haven't tried it before. Um, depending on the device you have, there are uh, different ways that you can upload things, but some people, uh, you know, most, a lot of people have iPhones or have Android phones, smartphones of some sort, and that's what they're using to record video. Um, not as many people have a separate digital camera or video camera anymore. So I usually give people instructions for how to do this. And um, one of the things you need to know is that little box with the arrow in it. And it looks a little different on an Android phone, but that's kind of how it looks on an iPhone. That means share this thing. Um, so if you are not aware of that, that's how you can get your video or your photo or whatever off your phone and into the world. And um, <clears throat> this is how you would get a video up to YouTube. So you just select your video, click that arrow or the share row, which is what some of us call it. And um, you have to look to see if YouTube is 
is available as something you can share to. And if it's not, you have to click the little more button and turn the YouTube switch on. Um, but if you don't have the YouTube app installed, that is not going to show up. So this is a source of confusion for some folks that I've talked to who are trying to upload videos to YouTube this way. Install the YouTube app first. Make sure you have selected a video and not a photo. I've done that a few times where I go, why, why don't I get this option? Why isn't YouTube an option? Duh, what's wrong with this stupid thing? And it was me. Uh, I had a photo selected and not a video, and so it just wasn't going to work. So you got to kind of line things up there, and then you can uh, add a title, description, tags, everything as uh, on the fly as you upload it. And then you just tap publish and wait for the magic to happen. So uh, it's really not a, a hard process, but if you haven't tried it before, you might want to try it with some little low stakes, like a test, and, and just see um, what what it, how the process goes for you. So it's not something you want to try for the first time when it's really you desperately need for students to see it right away. Just give it a little, give yourself a little practice time, and it's okay if you upload something that isn't really uh, genius level. You can go in and get rid of it later. <laughs> you don't have to share all of your silly test things with the world. Uh, one of the cool things that will happen with YouTube, um, if you're on your computer and you have a video on your computer and you upload, it will let you uh, know how much longer it's going to take. So if you uh, upload with your phone, you, it'll upload for a while and then it will process for a while. And that's when YouTube is doing some kind of behind the scenes stuff where they're looking at um, your video, they're trying to make sure, they're re-encoding it to make sure the quality is streamable on the internet. And uh, they also do some copyright checks and if you have like a large chunk of music that you did not originate, just like you took some recorded music and put it in there, <laughs> it will ding you for that and it will say, hey, this is copyrighted music. Yes, it has a little uh, algorithm that, that looks for that and it will, it will mute that music out. So be aware that you do need to be uploading stuff that you have the right uh, to use. And YouTube doesn't really care about fair use for education. There's not a lot. <laughs> you kind of have to um, use your own original stuff as much as possible. But while it's processing, and this is a screenshot, obviously, of what it looks like on the computer, um, it'll, it'll tell you how much longer it'll take. And while you're waiting, you can add the title, description, and tags. And you can check your privacy settings. Um, and this is something that um, a lot of people get concerned about. And we will come back to the privacy settings in a few minutes here. Um, so when you're uploading your video, you're going to have some options to edit video. Now, I have done a lot of video in the course of my job, and so I have access to YouTube and Snagit and Camtasia and Adobe Premiere and all this other stuff. But not everybody has those, those kinds of software to edit video with. Um, some people have iMovie, but they're not sure how to use it, or they just, you know, figure they have to upload things as they are, and they don't, they're like, well, I'm not an expert at video editing, so I'm not going to do that. There are some uh, pretty basic but pretty powerful video editing tools in YouTube, and you can really um, increase the effectiveness of the videos that you're uploading um, by doing a little bit of editing, and there's quite a lot of stuff you can do. So when you go into YouTube, you can go into the Creator Studio. Um, so at the top right of your YouTube screen, you'll see that um, account icon that has your little picture, or maybe it's just your initials, depending on how your school is set up. Um, I should mention that you're going to want to be make sure you're logged in under your um, school district account to do this, and probably be using Chrome. Always advise that you use Chrome for anything Google, YouTube related because it's all uh, designed to work best with the Chrome browser. And um, you'll see that button that says Creator Studio, which will take you into uh, a different screen. You'll get this sidebar that I've put um, to the right of my uh, screen, but that'll be on the left. And you'll be able to choose the video editor once you've selected your video. And you can actually do what is called basic timeline editing right there in YouTube. You can drag videos from your uploads into the timeline. So if you did a few seconds of video of, 
I don't know, a student project. And then there's a few minutes of you talking about that. And then there's a few minutes of the student talking about what they did or reflecting on it. You can take those three separate videos, upload them to YouTube, and then drag them into the timeline, order them in the way that you would like, and do some minor editing of links and um, timing, audio, and transitions, and make your video look pretty professional, and really make it a lot easier for people to watch. Um, I, I do a lot of training about using graphics and video and um, and basically kind of artistic things in class, and people don't, they say, well, you know, and that's just the foofy stuff, right? That's the, the pretty, making it pretty. but the reason that we try to make things a little bit pretty is because it really does help understanding. So I do think it's worth taking the time to learn to do a few of these things. Even if you're kind of inclined to not be fancy about it, it doesn't have to be fancy, but if we clean it up and make it easy to watch, it's going to definitely be a lot more useful. So I think um, before we talk about the privacy, we're going to pop over into YouTube here. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So here's my, hopefully you can see my Chrome, uh, my YouTube screen now. My little icon over here <coughs> shows my little head there and then Creator Studio. You also have a menu on this side, this little three lines menu which is, uh, some people call it the hamburger. I think it's a bit abstract for that, but I do like food references, so if that works for you, that's cool. Uh, that gives you your YouTube options. If you want to see what your channel looks like, you can go to my channel. And then some of your playlists will show up in that menu too. So here's my channel. I have my little icon, my channel artwork, and my settings here. Um, I have a little introduction that says who I am because my channel is public. And then I have playlists that I've created of other people's videos. Um, and then the uploads, the public uploads that I have uploaded are there. So this is what my channel looks like, <coughs> excuse me, from my perspective. I can go straight into the video manager from here, which will show the videos that I've uploaded. And you'll see that that also takes me over to a place where I can see this left sidebar, which is the Creator Studio options. I can also get there by clicking on this button. Okay, so that takes me kind of to the same place. So here are all the videos I've uploaded. And some of these are just tests. Some of them are official videos. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here, and they're all different levels of privacy. Um, so this is kind of just my repository of stuff that I have uploaded to YouTube. Whether I've edited it on YouTube or somewhere else or whatever, it's all here. Um, if I've made, <coughs> excuse me, if I've made playlists, um, those will show up here and then I can edit the playlist. So one way to use YouTube as a teacher is to make a playlist for different subject areas or units of study for your students. Um, when I was teaching uh, world history, I, or ancient world history is to make a playlist for each of our major units of study. So there would be an ancient Egypt playlist, there would be a um, ancient Greece playlist, and I would refer my students to those if they needed a little supplemental instruction, or if I had kids who just wanted more information. Um, and sometimes I would send them to my my playlist for a certain unit and say, find something that supports this concept and tell me you know what you think about it so there was a lot of ways to use that and it just gave my students a little bit of just extra stuff to look at that I had curated that I knew was appropriate for them and you know the rule with videos that we always watch the whole thing before we um, put it in front of students because sometimes everything may be perfectly appropriate except for that two seconds that gets you a parent phone call and we do not like that kind of parent phone call so always be really careful with that um, but it's really nice to kind of have a library of playlists just to share with your kids and whenever you're viewing a video there's an add to button underneath it and you can create a playlist right from the menu that opens up when you click that so I have one for robotics and I have just started that because I'm trying to find videos to share with teachers who are asking me what kind of robots to use in their classroom because that's kind of a project I'm in right now 
Um, I'm learning some things about ASL because I'm working at a, a school for the deaf quite a bit this year and I've needed to uh, up my skills there. Um, and I have a bunch of other playlists there that I can edit from here. If you are into doing live streaming, this is kind of an advanced uh, topic, but you can, um, and it wants to ask me a question about it too, <laughs> you can do that from here. So uh, if we wanted to live stream this webinar, we could start that here. Boy, that would be interesting to see what that did to go to webinar. I would never do that to you guys, but <laughs> you can live stream. Um, this is an option that uh, I believe in you can turn off for students, which is probably a really good idea because kids love to do that kind of thing and that's not the best idea. But you could live stream an event in your classroom and there are some pretty exciting things you could do with that as a teacher if you wanted to. Um, the community tab here just says this is what's happened on your channel. So if you allow comments under your videos, um, I don't know how many of you have read the comments under public YouTube videos, but they tend to be a bit of a cesspool in general, <laughs> in my opinion. People's uh, worst tendencies seem to come out in this reasonably anonymized forum. So as a teacher, I often encourage turning off comments. Um, and because there's there are other ways that your students can respond to a video uh, you can share it via Google Classroom and they can make their comments in that thread on classroom they can send you an email they can do it in a document um, they don't need to make public comments on YouTube in a way that might get away from you um, so I always recommend that you can turn that off and that is something you can do on a video by video basis um, but if I had comments here I could edit them and that it will try to see if some of them are spam so it kind of can detect if someone posts something that says hey I made a million dollars working from home watching YouTube videos you know if only but no <laughs> that, that would show up here and you would be able to go through and uh, kind of curate those comments and delete the ones that were not appropriate my channel I have some options here um, Copyright strikes are when they say, oh, you uploaded something that you don't own and we're going to yell at you about it. And if you do that too many times, it will kind of move along the spectrum to sad face. And I, the consequence is that at some point they get rid of your YouTube channel. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Um, community guidelines is if you are a person who goes into the comments and posts those um, unpleasant things and you get barked at uh, for YouTube because people are by YouTube because people are reporting you, you'll get sad face here. Um, so this will kind of just give you a summary of what your status is about. Um, are you allowed to live stream? Can you upload longer videos? Some of these depend on how many videos you've uploaded, whether you have connected your identity to a Google Plus profile. They basically want to know if you're a real person, if you're, what you're doing is legit and you're not posting, you know, weird stuff <laughs> that, uh, like if you're saying that stuff is appropriate for all ages and then you post things that are not appropriate, that'll be a strike against you. Some of these um, functions of YouTube are enabled after you've proven yourself to be a reasonable member of the community. So that's where you would find that stuff. Um, and there's a lot of stuff you can do down here. This advanced panel, again, I kind of had a screenshot of that. This is where you can decide whether you want ads to be um, displayed. And you can put in your website if you want to. You can allow your channel to be recommended um, by similar channels. If people are looking at them, it'll say, hey, go take a look at Ms. Livex channel. Um, and you can have a subscriber count showing up there. So if you're going to really get into uploading, this might be stuff you need to know. Analytics tells you how many people are viewing your videos and where they're coming from. Um, and down here is my Creator Studio stuff. So if I want to create a video, I can click Create. And it pops me into the audio library um, by default. But what I want to do is come down here to the video editor and click on that. <coughs> Excuse me. So here is a video, and it's trying to make a bunch of noise, sorry about that. <laughs> but this is a video that I was just playing with the editor uh, features. And so this is basically three separate videos that I uploaded. And one of these I actually created on another site, edited together, and then just dragged into here. 
Um, so this will let me take any of these videos that I have uploaded and drag them into this timeline. So these are three separate videos that I've used as clips in my larger video. And down below here is where I have some music, um, some sound effects that I have added over it. So if my video doesn't have any sound, I can add a voiceover. I can add music from their library. There's a lot of um, royalty-free uh, stuff audio-wise that you can add in, which is kind of neat. And I'm not, I'm going to spare you all the noises that will happen if I preview these, but I'm going to show you where they are. It's not really um, something that we can do very effectively in a webinar, but if you go in and poke around and poke these buttons, you're going to see um, what I mean. So when I do search videos here, I'm searching my videos. Right here, I'm in this video tab. If I go over here, this is my Creative Commons video tab. So these are royalty-free uh, videos. If you're not aware of what Creative Commons is, it's a licensing schema um, where people can f more freely share their content but still retain uh, their ownership of it. And uh, so I can say, hey, this is free to share for educational purposes, and you can even modify it, but you have to give me credit. So there's a bunch of different Creative Commons licenses. They have a repository of these videos. So if I want this traffic on the bridge um, video, it'll let me preview. That's 40 seconds of traffic on a bridge. Oh, that's great. I can just drag it down here. And now I can make it part of my video. And it's telling me that that's, it's, it's legal to do that. Um, these, nothing will show up in that filter um, that doesn't, isn't okay for me to use. And so then I could move this around within my video. And oops, I'll pause that again. It always wants to preview for me. So I can choose these, drag them down there. I can click and I can shorten it up. Maybe I only want 10 seconds of traffic on the bridge. Maybe I want my traffic on the bridge to do be over here. It, it's fairly intuitive. You can drag and drop a lot of stuff. I have some options once I've selected an individual clip as opposed to the whole video. Um, I can fix the brightness and contrast. If, if the video is shaky, like the camera was waving around, I can stabilize it. I can put it in slow-mo. I can do a bunch of stuff there that's kind of cool. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to close this with this little X, and that takes me back to my greater project. So that, for me, was the hardest thing because it's a little different um, than some of my other video editing to get used to. When I'm down here in a clip, it changes this here, and I have to close that to get back to my big, bigger video timeline here. Um, so that's my Creative Commons tab, and I can search here. I wonder if there are puppies in here, you know. Oh, yay, see, puppies. I can go grab some puppies to put in here. Again, preview things before you put them in your video. Uh, but most of these are going to be pretty appropriate. So I can search there. Um, if I have photos to upload, they don't have a library of it like they do for video, but I can add any photos by uploading them into my projects. So if I want to still of something, I can put that in. If you want to make a slideshow, this is a way you can do it with YouTube by adding photos to your project and then putting some music or something or a voiceover underneath. Here's my music tab, and these are all free to use. Um, and they'll tell you, I, I believe that there are some that you can actually pay for, um, but most of these have this little caveat it says, if you use this song, the song owner might show ads on your video. So you've got to kind of be okay with that. They're pretty good about having them be mostly appropriate ads, but you're going to want to keep an eye on that if you are using these as a teacher. Um, this is all different kinds of music, and it's just stuff that people have made available. Some of them might sound really good as background music for your stuff, and some of them not so much. This little um, triangles pointing at each other is a pretty uh, common icon for transitions. So if I want my octopus dance video here to transition nicely into whatever else is going on in the second clip, I can, well, let's do the star wipe. It's not very classy, but it's a good example here. <laughs> um, I can choose what kind of a transition I want to have between the two. I just drag it in between the two clips, and this will show you what a star wipe will look like. And that was a two-second one. 
So again, not probably the most professional one to choose, <laughs> but it does work. Um, I can do this cross blur one. I just drag it in between two clips and then I can preview the transition by dragging my little video head over next to it and watching it go through the transition between clips. And it's going to change here in just a sec. Come on, here we go. <laughs> So that's what a cross blur looks like. Actually, that works really well for this video because it's blurry at the beginning. Um, and I can change the, the length of the transition, make it a little slower, a little faster, depending on how long I want it. So I have a lot of different transitions to choose from. You might be familiar with some of those from PowerPoint. Um, Simple is always best for um, usability and educational purposes. Well, sometimes you want the star wipe just because it's fun, but uh, simple is good. If I go over here, this is how I can make a title. And titles are how you get your text. Let's see, I'll put one here. And so I can put this in between two clips or on top of a clip. And if I put it on top of a clip, it's going to be like, appearing on top of the video. Okay, that's a very exciting title. Um, but I can turn it off, turn it back on. All right, I can choose my font here. They have a few different fonts and I can change the size. Whoop, that's a wee bit big. <laughs> so you can, but um, it's all kind of non-destructive. I can always go back. If I don't want this title on there at all, I can always just click enable text and turn that checkbook box off and then it's gone. Change my color. So if I need some text over the top of it, I can do that. If I turn that one off and go back here, I could choose a different one. I could choose this banner one and then I can have one at the bottom. That's Waffles. He's my uh, sister-in-law's dog. He's really cute. <laughs> He doesn't really talk. That was a, actually a video that came out of the app ChatterPix and then was put into Wii video and now is in YouTube. I tend to reuse my clips a lot because I do some weird things. So, <laughs> But I experiment a lot and that's a good way to learn. So I would encourage you to do that. So there's your titles options. And then this will tell you how you can, um, if, you wanna, if you get pretty good at this, you can actually use the keyboard to um, go between uh, different functions. And that just gives you a little bit of help for how to do that. Um, and if I click this create video, it's going to take all the edits that I made and process it. And so that's why it's telling me, oh, you can't see this video right now. Um, if I want to go back to my video manager, that's going to show me my list of videos again. This is the video I just worked on. I didn't give it a real name. It's like preparing upload. Right now it's set to private um, because that is a total mess and I don't need anyone to see it just yet. <laughs> so while that's processing, I can go back here and we'll talk a little bit about those privacy settings. So you have a few different options. Um, when you choose private, your video is only visible to you unless you share with specific people. So this is more like anything you would share with Google um, Docs or Sheets or something. You can say, okay, I don't want anyone to see this or I want to put in a specific person's email address, okay? And that's how you share by clicking the edit pencil, then click share and put your email addresses in. Or you can also click a checkbox and say, anyone in my district can view this video, but no one outside can. And what that means is that if someone is logged into an email address for your district, so anything that ends, you know, at myschooldistrict.org or whatever the name of it is, uh, they'll be able to see it, and anyone who is not logged in to your district won't be able to. Um, private videos don't, I think, yeah, they default by default turn the comments off, which is fine. <laughs> so you can share those just within your district if you like. Uh, you can also do an unlisted video, which is where your video won't show up in YouTube search results and it won't feature it on the front page or anything, but anyone who has the link can view it. And that's how I do uh, a lot of mine. 
for classroom videos just because I'm not I don't need them to be super private but I also don't necessarily want them appearing without context in other people's search results um, and then a public video is one where everyone on the internet can view the video they can search in YouTube for it or a Google search might turn it up depending on the keywords that are associated with it so you can review those settings and um, this little embedded video is all you can also view at this link and it will tell you um, it's a, a person from YouTube who works for Google and will actually explain how those privacy settings work because it can be a little confusing so um, Captioning is kind of an interesting thing too. Um, this is a discussion that I've had a lot this year because I've been working in a school for deaf students and they use a ton of video. Um, they do a lot of uh, captioning as well as doing videos of teachers and students doing sign language. Um, so there have been a lot of interesting things to learn here but in, in my experience it's really nice to have uh, what we used to call in the special ed biz, because I was a special ed teacher for a long time, uh, multiple modes of input. So video is great, hearing you speak is great, but having the words up on the screen can also be great too. And it's not even necessarily a bad thing for kids who are pre-readers or not fluent readers to see those words going by at the correct speed. It's kind of a, a helpful thing. So um, you can go to that three lines menu and get into your channel, into the video manager or however you want to get in there. And you click the little triangle, they call this a disclosure triangle, next to the edit button on the video you want. So here's my, my video of my, my Christmas mantle which is covered in Star Trek ornaments because I'm a nerd like that. And I did a little video of it and so I could caption it um, by selecting the subtitles and CC um, menu item. And then I just tell it it's English, and then I have some options for how to uh, go ahead and get those captions in there. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, there are special file types that you can upload that are captioning files that you can create with different programs. Um, that can be kind of a, a technical way to do it, but there is a help page on Google that's linked here. When you see the the uh, help or when you see this presentation, you'll be able to click on that if you want to know about it. You can do transcribed and autosync, which is the fastest way to caption a video when you have speech on it. So if you are talking, um, like this, this recording of this webinar, they could transcribe and autosync if they uploaded it to YouTube. And if they had a script for everything I was saying, they upload the text of what I said, and then go, the uh, YouTube you know, computers kind of listen to the video and they line up the text in the script with the words that are being spoken. It's pretty slick and it happens, it works really well if you already have a script for what you wrote. Um, and so just a kind of an incidental note, um, as far as doing educational videos, I do recommend that you have a script when you can because you're gonna think you know what you wanna say and then you're gonna go, uh, <laughs> right in the middle of it. Um, and I, I do a lot of these and, and I would, I'm supposedly experienced at it and I still do that. So for me it's a lot better to have a script. Even if I deviate from it a little bit, it keeps me on track with remembering what I wanted to say. If I'm doing a voiceover, especially if I'm showing someone how to do something with a computer program or something. Um, so that, and that makes your captioning really easy. You can also manually enter. So say if I have a video that I didn't write a script for, I can upload the video, do this create new subtitles or CC, and I watch the video and then I just click in the little box and start typing. It'll pause the video and let me type the part that is happening then. And then I can kind of move those around and adjust them and make sure the words are coming up on the screen at the same time as that stuff is being said. Um, they also have professional captioning available. That's going to cost you some money kind of rather a lot of money it's actually pretty expensive <laughs> so unless you're doing something fancy that's probably not something you're going to need to do but just to know it's there and uh, let's see when you're ready to share <clears throat> we already kind of talked about your privacy settings but when we're talking about sharing directly to your kids there are a bunch of different ways you can do it if you're using Google Classroom, this is a great way to do it. 
um, you have a, a YouTube button right here in your classroom assignment uh, pane, which pops up when you hit the plus in Google Classroom and you create the assignment. You can give um, a title to your assignment, some directions. You can attach not only the video to the assignment, but also, say, a Google document with questions for the video on it. Or you can ask students to um, attach a, a Google Doc that has notes or a reflection or something on it when they turn it in. So it's a pretty smooth uh, way to get that into your digital workflow if you have a video you want them to watch, whether it's yours or not, because you just give them the YouTube um, location of that video. Uh, you can embed uh, into a Google presentation like this one a video. You can only embed YouTube videos at this time, but I'm hoping that they'll expand that. But it is pretty handy to have your videos on YouTube if you're using Google presentations a lot because then you can stick them into a slideshow just like this one and it works pretty well. Um, you can also add a video to a Google form and you can embed them in uh, a website using the embed code that you can get underneath your video. So if you're using some kind of a website creation tool like Wix or Weebly that a lot of teachers use, you can embed these videos that way. Um, if you're using Google Sites, you just say, hey, I want to put one of my YouTube videos in, and there's a button for that because they make it all kind of fit together pretty well. Um, so there are some... Uh, resources here for you if you want to take a look at these when the presentation or the links are shared with you. Um, there's a pretty good justification for why you should use video in your lessons. It has some pretty cool um, arguments about why this is a good thing to do. A couple of YouTube channels that can be helpful and uh, TED-Ed which is just a really awesome thing. Um, if you've ever used PlayPosit or anything like I think Edpuzzle is another one of the websites that you can use where you can actually make a video interactive and have the student watch it and at certain times it will pause and a question will pop up for them to reflect on and to kind of deepen the learning and make it more than a I'm just going to sit here and stare at the video <laughs> thing. Um, TED Ed, which is related to the, you know, the TED Talks that you've heard about, probably seen videos of those on YouTube. They partnered up with YouTube to make it so that you can create interactive lessons from any video that's on YouTube, including your own, and it works directly with the YouTube tool. So it's really, um, really awesome. And there's some pre-made lessons on there that are interactive that you could check out. So that's TED Ed. And I think I have finally babbled enough. And let's see if you guys have any questions. Hi, Catherine. This is Walter. Oh, okay. uh, what's fascinating is every time a question came by, you answered it. So... <laughs> Well, I'm but just we, good that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a few. Uh, one you you talked about, but is there any way to know who watched my video um, pertaining to a classroom? Uh, I saw you went to a slide which showed the number of people that actually watched it, but well, there is a, there's some analytics um, that you can load. Actually, I probably would want. So this gives me just how many people. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I go, let me try this. If I go to the video manager and look at a specific video, maybe. Hmm. I don't think you can get analytics that specific about it. If it was private, um, you know, you would know who you had shared it with. But I don't think there's anything that's going to tell me. Um, which one of those people has watched it. Um, in Classroom, you'll be able to see who has opened the assignment, and that's, I think, as close as we can get on that. Okay. Actually, that was the, <clears throat> that was the, they came back and said, you, when you answered it in Cl uh, Google Classroom, they okay. okay. kind of said, gee, that would be even better. Yeah. Uh, w when it comes and says shared, a certain student could have I mean, viewed or share, I think it's viewed, the word they use, Mm -hmm. The same student could watch it two or three times, so that number could be higher if if they watched it more than once. I guess that was right. one question. Yeah, uh, so yeah, you couldn't count on the analytics really to tell you if you have twenty six students and you have forty views, you just don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Um, the other question was, and I think you've answered it, but if I don't want anybody to see the video until say Friday, what's the best way to do that? 
Um, well, you can go in manually and change it from private to you know unlisted or whatever in YouTube. But if you're using Google Classroom, you can schedule a post. Um, so instead of um, assign the assign button that you get in your assignment tab, you click the little disclosure triangle, that little drop down that kind of looks like this, but it's next to your blue assign button, and you say schedule. And um, in Google Classroom, you can tell it that you don't want this to show up for students until that date. Awesome. Um, another one was when you were in the editor of editing the video, is there any way to export it in what they were asking? I guess you could export it out as like an MP3 for somebody to email or, you know, change or export it so that they could use it into like Wii Video or iMovie. I believe you can re-download stuff. It's still processing my weird little video that I made. <laughs> um, yeah, I can download it as an MP4. So here I am in my video manager, and here's all my videos. So I just click the little disclosure triangle next to it, and I hit download MP4. Um, so once you have it on your computer in an MP4 format, you could um, you know, convert it to a different format using a different you know, video program or, like you said, put it into Wii Video or whatever. And that leads me to the next one. Uh, it's uh, what I saw you do was quite, quite a bit of uh, editing there. Mm -hmm. In if they're used to Wii Video or say iMovie, what would be the limitations of what uh, Google Video Editor does? Well, I think um, if you're a fairly advanced user, and I've used you know Final Cut Pro and Adobe Premiere and stuff like that, so I have some different expectations than people who don't, don't do as much video. I'm like, hey, why can't I do this weird thing that nobody really needs to do? Um, but one of the things that I've noticed, um, Wii Video and iMovie have pretty similar feature sets, I think. Um, YouTube is definitely more limited as far as editing. One of the things that kind of bugged me that I couldn't do was I couldn't set um, keyframes in the audio, meaning if I have one long audio thing underlaying my video, I can't make it louder in some places and quieter in others. I would have to cut mm. it up and say, this one's loud, this one's quiet, you know. So I found that to be a limitation, but it is a timeline editing tool and you can drag clips around, change the links, do the transitions, all the basic stuff is really very similar. No, that's very good. I, I liked what you said there about the, those are the things we don't we don't realize when we get into those editors. The sure, last until thing, you tried it and it's not there and then you notice, oh, I can't do that there. The last one was uh, limitations of size for video that you found is appropriate in for classroom. Like length of video as yeah. opposed to file size. Um, well, I think it really depends on it depends on your kids. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're talking about you producing a video, short and sweet, I think is really good. Um, you know, if you're if you record yourself teaching the lesson in class, then it is what it is. And if a student, it's just if they want to go back and just review it and hear it, they know how to go scrub back and forth in videos. This is a 21st century skill that I, <laughs> these kids have got nailed. So if they go, no, I just want to get to the part where she's told us how to do this, you know, part of the algebra problem or whatever, they'll know how to do that. Um, again, younger kids, shorter attention span, and they also tend to kind of fry out on videos. I have an almost seven-year-old in my house, so I know how this goes. <laughs> um, so I would say keep it shorter for the younger kids. But, uh, you know, it, you know your kids, and I think probably you might have to crash and burn a couple times. It's hard to take those risks, but if I do a video and it's seven minutes long, and my kids were like, it was boring and I didn't watch it, you know, then I'm going to have to kind of take that under advisement and go, okay, we're going to try a different way because maybe for this group it's better to just hit the high points and then get the details to them personally in class. So it depends on how you're using the video, I think. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I came up with my own question there when you went there. Is is there a way to watch a video at two times speed like you can do audio? To watch I one? Yeah. I don't but know if you with, can watch with, one. I think you with can. With the sound. Um, I'll don't, have to look for that one. Not on YouTube, myself. I don't think so. I think you can, in your editor, I think you can speed and slow, speed up and slow down the clips. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, not. I don't think for playback. 
play back the teacher faster. So, okay, I <laughs> I am done with questions. Stephanie, I'm I'm I'll turn it over to you, Stephanie. Oh, okay, great. Um, thanks um, for handling all those questions, Walter. We got some good ones today, and Catherine, thank you because there was a lot in here. I was like, wow, really? You can do that, also? And um, <laughs> this is, you know, I think a lot of people may just scratch the surface with YouTube, and it, it's clearly got a lot more to it once you start um, digging through the controls, like you were showing us. So thank you so much for. For helping yeah. us with that. Yeah, it's good to know that stuff is there because I think a lot of districts don't necessarily make sure that teachers have access to other video editing software. That can be an expensive thing. So to know that it's included in your Google tools is kind of a, a real handy thing to have around. And then you just have to get past the uh, 21st century skill of seeing yourself on video and not dying, which mm -hmm. I still feel like doing on a regular basis. So <laughs> it's all right. You can do it. Good practice. Good practice, right? <laughs> um, well, excellent. If if you have nothing further, I'll go ahead and close out for today. Um, I take the screen back. I have a final slide and show my screen. I will try to make sure I'm actually doing that this time. <laughs> and a little technical. Can you see this one with the final um, information? I'm going to go into, not presenter view, but um, into present. I can see it. OK. I don't know if I'm not convinced it's full screen. But OK, people are saying they're seeing it, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> OK, so here's some final information for everybody. Uh, we've got my contact information and Catherine's, in case anybody has any questions. Um, also in this blue box, don't worry about memorizing this link. This will go out automatically in an email. And you can go to this link and just answer a very brief survey and receive a certificate of completion for attending today's webinar. In addition, this has been recorded and we post it at this site which again will be emailed to you, ctl.info slash webinars. And what's great about this site, not only is today's recorded webinar there, we have a huge library now. We've been doing these webinars um, over a year, I think about a year and a half. So any topic uh, you can think of is starting to <laughs> fill up in there. And we also will post announcements for upcoming webinars that you can register for. So, on um, behalf of CTL and our presenters, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And Catherine, thank you so much for your information. And I uh, hope to have everyone on the next webinar and have a great rest of your day.